good morning and welcome to our service at St Mary Magdalene with St Martins on our YouTube channel this morning. You're very welcome. If you're here for the first time, please just join in as you feel you would like to. And for all our church family, you should have been sent the order of service for today. So you can join in the liturgy where that's appropriate. We just want to remember today the life of our wonderful friend, Betty Lawson, who very sadly passed away on Saturday last. She'd been a member of our church for many, many, many years and is loved by all generations. And we are with her daughter Jennifer and her son Fred and her other daughter Glenda and all the family in prayer and in thought at this time. And for those who are in hospital, we think too of Fred again, who's in hospital uh, with COVID-19, and also of June, Michelle's mother, who's at Croydon University Hospital too, for the same reason. Our prayers are with them and all those whom we know uh, that are suffering at this time. Let's begin our service with a hymn of worship and praise as Hilary and her team lead us. special prayer, the collect for today. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladden the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us, that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life, and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to say a prayer and lead us into our prayer of confession. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, 
that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. So let us now confess our sins in penitence and in faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. We pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's reading is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him but we had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who had said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things, and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were our hearts not burning within us, while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. 
Then they told them what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Today's reading is taken from Acts chapter 2, verse 14 and 36 to 47. Peter addresses the crowd. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea, all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Verse 36. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. The first converts. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptised, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. Life among believers. All came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together, and all had things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods to distribute the proceeds, to all as many had need. Day by day they spent much time together in the temple, and broke bread at home, and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God for having the good will of all the people, and day by day the Lord added their numbers to those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. The wind goes wherever it wills. We cannot see it, yet we accept it exists because of the evidence of its power. We accept the help of the wind to create power for ourselves. For trade, for travel in the days of tall sailing ships, we enjoy the fragrance that the wind brings with it as it blows across gardens or fields or forests and itself takes the seed heads and plants them somewhere else. It brings sand from the Sahara, sometimes as even as far as London. And it's a very powerful force to walk against when it's a really strong gale force wind. The wind can be a huge, powerful force and a gentle zephyr, a breeze that is cooling and refreshing. We can only ever examine its effect, not the wind itself as an entity. Peter and many other disciples of Jesus had just experienced the power of the Spirit of God coming to fill them and to equip them. As you know, the Spirit is described by Luke, who wrote the Gospel and this wonderful book of Acts, as a strong wind as powerful as a tornado. There was no doubt in Peter's mind that this is the gift given by God to all who come to him. This book of Acts leads us on a journey. We travel with Luke on a road that leads us into the excitement and the adventure of the early disciples and we hear their testimonies of the power of God at work. On this particular occasion, Jesus' friends and in fact most of the Jewish population of the known world at the time knew the promises of the Old Testament prophets of the coming of Jesus' Messiah, the Saviour, also called the Son of David or the Son of Man. Hundreds of Jewish people had come from many countries making pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost is a harvest festival where they gave thanks, as we do in ours, for the harvest for God's provision in our lives. But in this particular year, it was an additional harvest that the disciples were giving thanks for. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the provision of God, so remarkably poured out on Jesus' followers that day. 
those men and women were undeniably and powerfully filled with the Spirit, and with him came the gifts and courage to tell others who Jesus is. And here we are in this chapter two, listening to Peter speak as he finishes his speech. It's only been 10 days since Jesus, the risen Lord, has ascended to heaven. G uh, Peter is speaking to many, and in his speech, he makes two very clear points. The first is that Jesus is the one they are waiting for. It's about his identity. And the second is that this extraordinary experience of the Holy Spirit being given is fulfilling the prophet's words in Joel. Peter is preaching to crowds, many of whom only 50 days earlier had been crying out to Pilate to crucify Jesus. He had given them the opportunity, as happened at Passover, to release one criminal and he gave them the opportunity to release Jesus, the Son of God. But instead they chose Jesus called Barabbas, the one who himself had committed a crime, and Jesus, the innocent, was crucified. Now, as those same people heard Peter's message, saw the power of the Spirit moving through them, it was as if their eyes had opened and they saw for the first time who Jesus really is this Jesus whom they had condemned to death, whom they had blasphemed. Peter has said that the key and vital point about Jesus who undoubtedly lived, they had seen him, they'd heard him, they'd been with him, they saw him in his resurrected form. This Jesus is the one whom God has made both Lord and Messiah. Lord because he has been exalted he has been raised from the dead and has ascended into heaven. Messiah, because this term refers, refers to Jesus' status as the heir of God, often indicated as being the son of, son of David, son of man. He is the one they've been waiting for through the prophets, forecasting of his coming as a saviour. So Peter has just been speaking and proclaiming that Jesus is both Lord and Master, which is why we call him Jesus Christ, the Greek form of the word Messiah. And Peter contrasts this identity with the crowd's treatment of Jesus just a few weeks earlier. This Jesus whom you crucified, in your eyes, he was a criminal of the worst order, warranting execution. This Pentecost, these people see the power of God, the tornado-like wind, the flames of fire, the speaking in other languages. Just pause for a moment. What do you make of Jesus' identity? Who is he? Who is he in your life? And why do you think as you do about him? The two on the road to Emmaus are interesting. They're downhearted and grief-stricken that Jesus has died. We do not know how well they knew Jesus. They had heard stories of his resurrection earlier in that day. So we presume they, were, they knew the disciples and they knew where to find the disciples later on that day. They'd heard stories of Jesus' resurrection from some of them and yet they remained grief-stricken. That's interesting because the possible news that Jesus was alive didn't lessen their grief. It may even have increased their anxiety. Whatever their experience was, they didn't recognise him when they met him on the road, when he came up and joined them on their walk. In the same way, Mary Magdalene did not recognise Jesus when she encountered him at the tomb earlier that day. As the two travelled and the stranger came along, they listened to him and they recognised the truth that he taught as he opened their eyes to understand the scriptures, that the Son of Man would die and would be uh, raised from the dead. Jesus was gradually opening their eyes to see, and finally, as he broke bread with them, they understood. Their eyes were opened. Their revelation didn't come from information sharing. It came from Jesus himself revealing himself to them. There is nothing wrong with a gradual process of revelation. And when they realised, 
I think it's a bit like that moment when the penny drops and you suddenly understand something you've been struggling with. It all makes sense. And what's more, it's a far greater reality than you could ever have imagined. So full of wonder and excitement, they returned to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples, only, disco only to discover that Jesus had appeared to Simon as well. As the crowd in Jerusalem at Pentecost heard Peter's words, they were cut to the heart. This is a very deep reaction. The full realisation of what has happened causes deep, deep pain, a grief, remorse, guilt, shame. What have we done? They may well have cried out in their hearts, for they are in anguish. The judgment that comes from their laws of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in terms of recompense and retribution may well have governed their response of terror and fear. What shall we do, they say? In other words, what can we do to be saved from this terrible shame and guilt and responsibility? Now, Peter is not actually piling the guilt on here. What he is doing is exposing and presenting the truth. He is not lauding it over the people. He's not saying, I've got it right and you've got it wrong. He's being a signpost for them to find the truth. And what truth is this? That God is love. And Jesus' life given freely is the deepest expression of that love. John writes in his gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, so that we may not perish, but have eternal life. And the crowds are about to experience this truth, the true identity of love in Jesus. In response to their cries, Jesus has two things to say, repent and be baptized. Peter says nothing about making retribution. There's nothing in what he says about making recompense. There is nothing in there, in fact, about earning God's favour. Not that you shouldn't make recompense, but that that is not the way to find God's favour. He uses the word repent. This is what the younger son in the story of the prodigal son did. If you read Luke chapter 15 to familiarise with that story later, you'll see that this young man had rejected his father and his father's home and had taken his share of the inheritance that would have been his and gone his own way. He'd gone and lived out life as he wanted to. He'd run out of money and found himself in a time of desperation and famine, with nothing to eat but the pig's food that belonged to the pigs that he was looking after. Yet whilst in the depths of the pig's will, this Jewish lad comes to his senses. Luke says, he came to his senses and he said to himself, my father's servants are treated better than I am. He goes on to decide that he would go back to his father. He would say, I'm sorry I have sinned. Please take me on as one of your servants. And so he sets off. And you know what happens. The father could have said to him, you've done so many things that are wrong, I won't have you back. Or he could have given him a room in the servants' quarters and worked him hard in order to earn his keep. But no. What the father does is that he's watching there, waiting for his son to return. He gathers up his long robes and runs out to meet him. He embraces him, doesn't even let him speak, but instead calls the servants to bring the finest clothing for him, to kill the fatted calf and to celebrate. This young man, he says, is my son. He was lost and now he is found. You know what it's like uh, when you are in uh, the car and you go the wrong way and your sat-nav tells you to recalculate or it says it's going to recalculate for you or it tells you to turn around and make a U-turn. Basically, it wants you to go in the opposite direction from the way you have been going. To repent, we have to turn right around to face the opposite direction. That is what that young man did. So God's response to anyone turning away from the wrong way they've been going and turning around to him is that of complete forgiveness. There is nothing that God cannot forgive. And so Peter says, you, when you repent, be baptised. Now baptism, the word means to dip, to be dipped right under the water. It was familiar 
not just because John the Baptist baptised people for repentance, but also because everyone who arrived on pilgrimage in Jerusalem at the temple steps would take off their travel-weary clothes and get into a personal mikvah, just like a personal deep bath. And through that mikvah, through that deep bath, was running uh, live water, spring water, the water of life, living water it was called. And it was big enough and deep enough for one person to go in and submerge themselves and come out the other side and then put on fresh new clothes which were on the other side of the mikvah waiting for them. This sign of living water cleansing them from their journey in life in order that they may be pure. Remember how Paul talks about being clothed with Christ. Many years ago in the Eastern Church, especially when someone was baptised and made their statements of faith, they would face west in the direction of sunset, the end of the day, as they proclaimed that they were repenting of their sin. And then they would turn around in the opposite direction to face the east, where the sun rises, where the new day dawns, to proclaim, I turn to Christ and I follow him. Peter makes clear that God's gift of the Holy Spirit is given for all. On repentance and baptism, the Holy Spirit is given. Joel the prophet had said that the Spirit would be poured out onto all people of all ages. That with repentance and forgiveness, with baptism and with cleansing, God gives the Holy Spirit to teach, to guide, to convict, to empower, to guide you into the wholeness of living for him. This filling of the Holy Spirit is something that Paul in his letters encourages all believers to seek again and again. He says in Ephesians, keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit isn't about a particular way of worshipping. Being filled with the Spirit does not mean that every Christian will become an extrovert worshipper. There are many who are and there are many who are not. Just bear in mind those who are called to, who, to set apart their lives to pray, the hermits and the uh, fathers of the um, ancient church, those who join religious orders, those who in their homes find that it's the stillness and the silence where the presence of God dwells. No, this filling of the Spirit changes us all in one very particular way, that our reliance and our foundation is in Jesus and our lives are transformed by him. He enables us through the power of the Spirit to live for him. Romans 5 verse 5 says this, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the power of the Spirit. God engages with you all day long. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. My response today in this time of lockdown could be to ask a few questions and then in quietness to consider the answer. You could ask yourself, who do I think Jesus is? Not what do I think about other Christians or the church, but who do I think Jesus really is? Ask God to show you Jesus. Read about him in the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Ask him to show you where repentance is needed in your life and say sorry. You can ask him to fill you with his love by the power of the Spirit and ask the Spirit to come. Whatever our circumstances are today, nothing can separate us from the love of God, nothing at all. Dear God, during these times we turn to you for help, guidance and advice. We praise you for your goodness and kindness. Father, we ask you to especially protect the elderly, poor and vulnerable. We also ask you to help the young and strong to maintain healthy and giving them advice and guidance. We also ask you to help those on the streets with no home to ensure they have safety and protection from this disease and that they are able to socially distance and keep safe. We, 
We thank you for providing us with food, drink and a roof over our heads and a safe place to be during these times. We also pray that those on the front line who are unable to socially distance are kept safe, protected and in good health so they are safe to go home to their loved ones. May we also hold in our hearts all of our key workers and those who have had relatives or friends or know of people who have either passed away or been affected by this disease. May we follow the light of your love and spread hope. Amen. God, we pray for our country as it is still in the grips of coronavirus. At this time, we remember all those who have died since the start of the pandemic. We pray especially for the families who have lost their loved ones. Let them find comfort in the love of your unwavering presence. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering from COVID-19 and other diseases that have multiplied in the wake of coronavirus. We pray for those in hospitals and care homes, and we pray that you give them the strength to get through their sicknesses. We thank you for all the healthcare and key workers who are working tirelessly to fight this disease. We thank you for their selflessness and courage to serve others despite the dangers that they are facing. As we enter into our fifth week of lockdown, we ask that you will give wisdom and a balanced judgment to the government in order that they make the right decisions at the right times. Although this pandemic has affected all our lives in unprecedented ways, we thank you, Lord, for the small things that have kept us going. We are especially grateful that we can gather together and worship you, though we are physically apart. There is a lot that we do not understand about our current situation, both in the UK and across the globe. But in all this uncertainty, I pray that we will be able to reposition our perspectives upwards to you. I pray that we will face the coming weeks with hope. Hope that we will all meet again. Hope that life, although it will be changed, will start to regain normality. Hope that we will overcome this virus. In particular, for those who have lost loved ones, hope that they will be reunited again in heaven. I pray that the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord in the weeks to come. Amen. Amen. In this time of really great uncertainty and for so many a time of real difficulty and of anxiety and pain, it's really good to come together and to be able to affirm our faith in God, our Father, who loves us beyond all measure, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, whose presence is with us, and in the Holy Spirit, who lives within us. So let's do that now as we say the words of the Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. When Jesus came and stood amongst his disciples, he said to them, peace be with you. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. If 
you're with somebody now, share a sign of that peace with one another. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread. He gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. And with your whole church throughout the world, we lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. As our Saviour taught us, so we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving. The body of Christ. The blood of Christ. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. We're going to sing another hymn together now as Hilary and her group lead us.
As we come to the end of our service and the blessing, may you know God's peace in your home and his comfort within your family life. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.